Hey, thanks so much for accessing this content. I just had a chance to preach locally and thought, you know what? You know who needs to hear this? My Red Letter Living audience. So I hope you enjoy it. I'm excited today to kick off a new series. I, today we're talking about the best-selling book of all time. It sold more than five billion copies. It's downloaded on more than half a billion devices, at least on the YouVersion app. Uh, 70 million Americans have read through the entire thing, which is pretty incredible because the average person, it takes over 100 hours to read through it. So, of course, today we're talking about Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. <laughs> of course not. We're talking about the Bible. We're talking about this book today. Is this God's word? Is this God's story? Is it credible? Is it reliable? Has science disproved it? That's what we're diving into today. My goal this morning is that you would have so much confidence in the reliability of this book that you trust what it says. I want to repeat that. My goal is that you would have so much confidence in the reliability of this book that you trust what it says. And so today we're going, we're going like to school today. I got a whiteboard out. We're taking notes today. Uh, new research is out that 99% of people that take notes do go to heaven. So like you should probably do that. That's where we're at. I want to teach you today about the Bible, which we believe is God's word. So we are kicking a new sermon series off. It's called The Reason for God. It's loosely based off Pastor Timothy Keller's book from 15 years ago. And, and the goal in this series is answering six difficult questions. Today, is the Bible a myth? Other questions in future weeks are like, how can you say there is only one way to God? What gives you a right to tell me how I can live? Uh, does God... Uh, good God really allows suffering? Things like that. Questions that skeptics have. I think it's a really great series for those who are skeptical, for those who are wrestling, for those who are spiritually curious, for those who are deconstructing and hopefully trying to reconstruct their faith. This is a great series for you. By the way, if you're walking alongside of one of those people, this is a great series for you too, to give you information, to give you logic and argument and reason for some of these things as well. So it's called The Reason for God, and I'm so excited to kick it off with you today. So when we approach the Bible, I do want to say this at the forefront, though. At the end of the day, the reason that you and I believe in Jesus and therefore believe in the Bible is because we, uh, not because of proof, and not even because of proof that I'll tell you today, but rather because the Holy Spirit has worked that faith inside of us. And so that's why we believe there's no reasoning or argument or statistics or proof that all of a sudden the light bulbs will go off and say, I've now heard enough and been statistically proven into believing the Bible. No, you, you come into a belief in the Bible through the power of the, this word and through the power of the Holy Spirit working in you. That's why two people can look at this book and have two very different opinions. As much as Americans are still into this book, though, the confidence in and the reliability of this book is waning. More and more think that this is just a collection of stories and fables, and that it's not really truth. And, and actually, more, more to home here in Omaha, our confidence of this Bible is waning even more than the national average of those churched adults. Uh, a new study, like brand new, literally this week, that's coming out with research uh, is the State of the City Project here in Omaha that's telling us all about what Omahaans believe about, about, about the Bible, about God, about Christianity. And, and here's a couple that literally just this, this week came out. 59% of churched adults in America say the Bible has authority over what I say and do. 59%. Only 38% of Omaha churched adults say the same thing. Way behind. 43% of all churched Americans believe the Bible is totally accurate in all of the principles it teaches. Omaha is at 27%, way behind. 53% of Christians in America believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God and contains truth about the world. 41% of Omaha Christians, again, way behind. And so I recognize that even this message I'm giving into a room filled with Omahaans, by the way, Omaha Christians, that, that we're all not coming from the same, same place. So what I want to do today is I want to give you, uh, I want to dive deep into what really is this book. I want to look at three aspects of the Bible today. I want to look at the inspiration of the Bible. Everybody say inspiration. I want to look at the formation of the Bible. Everybody say formation. And then I want to look at preservation of the Bible. Everybody say, yeah, yeah, there you go. You, you caught on. Good job. You guys are smart. Smart Omaha Christians. The first one of those through the inspiration, this really is, is hitting more at the faith side of things. And then the, 
the, the next two uh, are going to be hitting more at the reason. So I, wanna do, I do want to tell you what the traditional Christian belief, what the traditional Christian faith says about the Word of God and how it's inspired. But then what I want to do is I want to back that up with the formation and preservation to give you some reasoning behind that so that you know that this is not a blind faith that we, that we enter into, that actually science and reasoning and logical arguments and history and archaeology all actually help support the reliability and credibility of the Bible as being true. So let's do this. Inspiration of the Bible. Uh, imagine you're a teenager and you get a text in high school and some of you are like, uh, that I've already, you've already lost me because I didn't have text when I was a teenager. Fine. Just imagine you got this message then on a note paper slid underneath your desk that says, hey, we haven't spent much time together lately. Date this weekend, question mark, you and me to catch up. Now, how would that come across if it was A, from your mom and dad or B, from someone you had a crush on? I think we can all admit that that little example proves it's important who the words are coming from. It's important to know who the author is because it means something different. And so the question we have when it comes to the Bible is, who wrote the Bible? Is it just a bunch of really great thinkers? Or is this, in fact, God's word? And if it is God's word and he wrote through great thinkers, how did that process really go? The verse we come to, and this is most often, is 2 Timothy 3 verses 16 and 17. Any word, by the way, that is in red, I want you to go ahead and say those out loud today. This says, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God, what does it say? The man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so this God breathed is usually where we get the word God inspired from. This is what it means, the scripture, is that, that it did come through, it was breathed, it was inspired. It did come from the voice of God, but somehow it came out through these, these writers, these different writers. And so what does this look like? While it is a matter of faith, I will attest to that, the Bible isn't silent on this process either. In fact, we have different people. Uh, Jeremiah, who says in Jeremiah 30, verse 2, that God said to him, write all the words that? Come on, let's do that again. I want a little more intensity and enthusiasm out of you. We're in, we're, in, we're in class today. Come on. I'm the teacher, you're the students, and I demand that you will do this or you will have detention after where we will look even more into this. <laughs> Write all the words that to you in a book. Great. And then the next guy, David, he says it this way in 2 Samuel. He says, the spirit of the Lord spoke by me and is in my tongue. Then we, have, then we have Peter who says it this way in one of the books that he wrote. He, he said that prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And then finally, the Apostle Paul, in one of the letters to the Corinthians, says it this way. He informs us of the things which he taught were expressed in, quote, which the Holy Spirit teaches. So somehow there's this transfer of information from God to human beings, to then on the words in the page. And we see that even in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're, they're the same account of Jesus' life and ministry, but each one of them is writing to a select audience and, and has its own sort of unique personalities and quirks and conversations and nuances that the other Gospels miss out on. And so we get to see the author's personality, the author's style. We get to see as well that the writings come from a wide variety of, of authors, if you think about it, because God called, in some cases, kings to write books, and in other cases, peasants to write books. He calls tax collectors to write books, and fishermen to write books, and scholars to write books. And so we get this wide variety. But we really don't quite understand exactly how that worked out. And that's okay. And that's, again, I know the series is called The Reason for God, but that's where faith comes in. But here's what I'm saying. It matters whose words these are. If they're just words of, of great thinkers, then it would be a great piece of literature. But if they're God's words, then it changes eternities. If it's Peter that says, which he did in, the, in, in, the, in, in one of his letters, cast all your anxiety on me because I care for you, I think we'd all be like, yeah, Peter, I'm not buying that, man. Where were you when, when, when Jesus needed to friend anybody? So no thanks. But if it's God that says, cast all your anxiety on me because I care for you, that means, whoa, anytime I'm anxious in this world, I can bring that to God and he wants to take that from me because he cares for me. That's cool. 
If it's Paul or some unknown author that says, never will I leave you or forsake you, we might legitimately get a restraining order on that person. (laughs) But if it's God, how comforting to know that no matter what I'm going through in this world, my God is with me. My God is for me. He hasn't left me. He's right by my side. So the traditional Christian belief faith is that this is the inspired word of God. Somewhat of mystery, but not totally silent on, on how this, this book in, in, in came to be and how these are the words of God. And there are many people that ask pastors today, one of the most often questions we get is, how do I hear the voice of God? And this is what I want to say to you. It's right here. You can take this word anywhere, anytime, and open up and hear a God speak to you. And this word says it's active and alive. It's breathing. It's still moving today. Just two nights ago, I was sitting with a pastor from Chicago, and and he was telling me in his journey as an 18-year-old, as he was exploring other religions, he didn't grow up in the faith, that he, he explored the Quran and the writings of Buddha, and nothing happened. But when he opened this and he started reading through the Gospel of John, he realized this really is Jesus. He really is the one true God, the way, the truth, and the life. And so I want to ask, what really is this? Is this the Word of God? And I'm even convicted, like this morning, uh, even as I was worshiping, if this really is the word of God, I treat this thing way too cavalier. When the word of God says I ought to tremble, not in fear, but like out of awe and like unbelief that, wow, this really is God's words for me and for you. Wow. I hope that's what you believe. Only 41% of Omaha Christians do. If you believe it, by the way, you don't have a blind faith. And that's where I want to get to the reason side of this. Hey, we're going to get you right back to the video. But first, subscribe to this channel. We've got loads of content that's going to help challenge you to be a greater disciple, whether it's other sermons or podcasts, and even some video challenges for you to complete. All of it's happening here on this channel. So let's get right back to it. And so I want to talk now about the formation of the Bible. Um, So yeah, I need a new whiteboard. Uh, We're going to need multiple whiteboards here today. Formation of the Bible. When you think about formation, let's first talk about Old Testament. Old Testament was pretty widely accepted by the time of Jesus. In fact, there were 39 books at that time, much like we have the 39. The only difference was the order of them has changed a little bit, but they were pretty widely accepted by the time of Jesus. And so in the, in the, Uh, Formation of the Bible, in the Old Testament at least, again those 39 books, what you have is stories from creation until 400 BC in those 39 books. And so we have, like I said, the very beginning um, to, to 400 years before Jesus came. And in this, we have the story of Genesis, we have the, the Ten Commandments and the law, we have historical documents that, that trace God's relationship to all of humankind, and then, and then quite a few books that also trace his unique relationship with Israel, who was supposed to spread the word to the rest of the world. And so in addition to that, we have books of poetry and of, of songs and wisdom literature and all of those things included in that. And so from 400 B.C., Until Jesus, you have a few books known as the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha are not widely accepted in Christian circles except for the Roman Catholic faith. And this is where the Roman Catholic faith get a couple of their pretty key central doctrines that you don't find in many mainline churches. Doctrines like praying to the saints and purgatory. And so that's where they get those. But the most traditional Christian faiths don't have those. And so that's the Old Testament. When we get to the New Testament, things really start to take shape. To understand how the 27 books of the New Testament come together, you need to understand the definition of this word, canon. And I'm not talking about a military canon, I'm talking C-A-N-O-N. It's a Greek word, meaning reed or measuring rod, and its definition is a general law, rule, or principle, or criterion on which something is judged. And out of that comes a second definition, which is a collection or list of sacred books accepted as genuine. And so the New Testament canon developed over 250 to 300 years of Christian history, which means this. The New Testament was not delivered by an angel. The New Testament was not dug up in a farmer's field like golden plates in the Book of Mormon. The New Testament was not dropped from heaven, and the New Testament was not all of a sudden discovered in a clay jar with 27 books intact like the Dead Sea Scrolls. It developed 
It evolved, it formed over 250 to 300 years. And I actually think if it had been delivered by an angel or sort of unearthed as one whole document and that's all that we had, I actually think the historical reliability and credibility could be questioned more than what we have, which is a very careful look at how the New Testament has progressed, developed, and come into being. And so that's the journey I want to take you on. How did the 27 books get to be the 27 books? And by the way, as a kid, I I always grew up in the Christian faith. I just always accepted this was God's word. But it wasn't until like seminary and I started getting some classes and some other things going on that I was like, oh, I need to really look into this more to see what really is this. So there's three, three criteria for canon. Number one is apostolic authority. And so was the book written by an apostle or an eyewitness or at least somebody in connection to that group of apostles? So that means anything after 100 AD doesn't count. Secondly, widespread usage and acceptance and that's not just like in one church, that's in every church, in, in, um, in every city, in every country that the word of God was being taught. And then third, conformity to the faith. This is the theological doctrinal side. Is, um, it's really hard to spell and write and do all this at the same time. Anyway, um, this was the theological side to say, uh, is the teaching in this book consistent with our Christian faith? So if it had all three, it had a good chance of being in the canon, the New Testament. And so to to get a real picture of how it's developed, you need to look through the church fathers. And thankfully, a lot of really smart people have done this. And so I'm taking their work and condensing it down even more for us today. But there are droves of works and, and, and things that you can go deeper with this. And I would encourage you to do that. By 175 AD, 175 AD, we, we pretty much know that the four Gospels are considered widely used, accepted. Irenaeus was a church father, and he wrote this in Against the Heresies. He said, it's not possible that the Gospels can be either more or fewer in number than they are. For since there are zones of the world in which we live and principal winds, while the church is scattered throughout all the world, it is fitting that she should have Pillars, from which fact it is evident that the word who was manifested to men has given us the gospel under aspects, but bound together by one spirit. Already by 175 AD, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John have taken shape, and that's important to know. You see, at the time I was in seminary, I was learning about uh, another school of thought that was becoming popular like around 150 to 200 AD, and maybe you've heard of it. It's called Gnosticism. It's from the Greek word gnosis, and what that word means is knowledge. And so Gnosticism taught that the problem with humanity is not sin. The problem is that we don't possess the right knowledge. And so like there's this secret knowledge that only a few have. And so this was really important around those times. And when I was in seminary, it was actually getting steam again and and picking up steam. And it all all came, by the way, through the work of a a fictional author named Dan Brown that wrote a book. How many of you remember this book called The Da Vinci Code? Remember that? Again, I I quote a fictional book. (laughs) But in this fictional book, Dan Brown asserts some of his own, of course, beliefs and opinions into it. And, And a lot of people were questioning it. And so in this book, uh, Dan Brown questions how the Bible came into being and talks about all these secret gospels and how actually the Bible came into being. It was from the Roman Emperor Constantine in 320 AD that there were more than 80 gospels and he picked the four that he wanted and that's how we got the New Testament. But we know that's not quite true because 150 years earlier, 175 AD, they were already consistently using four. But People didn't know this, and so they just started taking him at his word. There was even one professor that stood up in front of his class and held up, again, a fictional book, The Da Vinci Code, and said, now this book has disproven Christianity. Crazy. You know what's even crazier? That professor was at the University of Texas. (laughs) We just can't trust stuff from Texas. (laughs) Amen? (laughs) I heard one boo back there. I wonder who's sitting over there. (laughs) So he was bringing a lot of fear. And again, this was right when I was going to seminary. And so I was like, you know what? I'm learning about this stuff for the first time, and I've never really done a deep dive myself. I've just always taken it to be what it is because I'm a trusting person. Let me look into this. And so part of his 
uh, scare tactics were, gosh, there's all these other gospels that they're not telling you about. And so I was like, okay, well, what are they? And so I started reading a couple of them just for my own sake. And one of them that's the most famous is called the Gospel of Judas. Of course, attributed, you would think by that name, to the one that betrayed Jesus, except when you look at the Gospel of Judas, it wasn't Judas that wrote it, because we know what happened at the end of Judas's life. It actually was written, again, right around the time of Gnosticism, around 150 A.D., so it actually fails all three of the criterion for canon. It wasn't apostolic authority because it wasn't written by Judas. It was written 100 years after, at least. It wasn't widespread usage. And, and, it, it, and, and unlike the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus is not the hero in the Gospel of Judas. You know who the hero is? Judas. Why was he the hero? Because Judas possessed this secret knowledge, and he knew that Jesus must die. And so he was doing all of us a favor and he's treated as a martyr. Clearly, nowhere close to what we believe. Another one that they really talked about up was the Gospel of Thomas. They don't want you to know there's these other Gospels and here's the real stuff. And so you look at the Gospel of Thomas and it's actually not a historical account. It's, it's more a collection of sayings, mostly from Jesus, but also from some of the disciples. And, and this one also was written 150 to 200 AD, around the time of Gnosticism, so it, it fails that, that first criterion of apostolic authority. Uh, it wasn't widespread usage or accepted um, because it, it didn't conform to the faith as well. So it failed all three. What's crazy about the Gospel of Thomas and what got people stirring up is it actually did, word for word, quote for quote, use a lot of what's in our four Gospels. And it actually used also other words from other New Testament books, which proven, again, it was written at a later time. So it has a lot of the right language, but then they would throw in, and there's lots of them in there, these really bizarre sayings, these bizarre teachings that are like, clearly that's not it. So I just picked one out so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. This was maybe the most bizarre to me. Uh, Simon, Peter, and Jesus were having an exchange. Simon, Peter said to them, the disciples, let Mary go forth from among us, for women are not worthy of the life. <laughs> what? And then Jesus said, behold, I shall lead her that I may make her male in order that she also may become a living spirit like you males. For every woman who makes herself male shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. So, I hope you can tell, in my case, the more I looked at these quote-unquote other secret gospels, you know what I felt? The more confidence in this book, that this really is God's word. It wasn't, wasn't Constantine that chose the gospels for the sake of Rome for his own political power. That didn't even happen at a council. They did have councils. Constantine even called one. And you know what they did to those councils? They combated heresy, and that's where they came up with some of the creeds that we recite today. But they didn't pick and choose what worked out best for them. The real answer is this developed over 250 or so years. And these were the books that fit the three criterion for the canon. And that's why we have them. So how do we know then that we can trust? That was 250, 300 AD. That's great. Zach, it's 2023 now. So, so how do we know that what they said is also what we have? And that's where I want to bring out my third whiteboard. I've never had so many whiteboards in a message, guys. <laughs> I want to talk now about the preservation of the Bible. Everybody say preservation. preservation. <laughs> so there are many liberal scholars that, that, will, that will say that you're dumb, you're stupid, you're unintelligent if you believe in this. One of those scholars, his name is Bart Ehrman. And he's actually went on uh, The Daily Show, The Colbert Report, and, and argued on there. I always actually love, by the way, Stephen Colbert's argument um, that he gives back. But one of the things Bart Ehrman does is he, he, he tries to, uh, again, let me just read a couple of his quotes. He says, there's not a single scholar on the face of the earth that buys any of it. It's an exaggeration, by the way. Then he'd go on a couple more quotes. Actually, let me just read this one. He says, there are more discrepancies or variances in our ancient texts than, than, what, we, than what we have actual words. And, and as we look at this, before we dismiss that claim, Ehrman's actually right about that. There's more discrepancies or little changes in our New Testaments than we have actual words. And he says that to scare you. And if that's all you knew, like, you ought to be scared, like, wait, what? 
That sounds crazy. That doesn't sound like something I can have confidence in the reliability. I'm not feeling so good anymore. And people, by the way, eat this stuff up. Every time Bart Ehrman shows up on one of those shows, his books, like misquoting Jesus, become the number one seller the next day on Amazon. But, but Ehrman, he scares and manip- manipulates people by only telling half-truths. So let me tell you reality. And I give credit to Professor Daniel Wallace. He's a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary. So Texas is making a good comeback here. Let me just, let me just say that to all the people who are offended by Texas, which is one in the room, and his wife. <laughs> Daniel Wallace says, uh, yeah, he's right. But we need to look at three things when it comes to those variances, or when I say variances, like discrepancies or differences in the text. He says, number one, we need to look at quantity. Everybody say quantity. quantity. Two, we got to look at quality. You say quality. quality. And three, orthodoxy. Go for it. Awesome. So he says there's more variances than there are Greek words. He's right. There's uh, 138,162 words. Remember that for Jeopardy someday. That'll be important. And there are over 400,000 variants, two and a half times. What he doesn't tell you is the reason there's so many variants is because there's so many manuscripts. How many of you ever remember playing the telephone, uh, the childhood game Telephone, right? Where you whisper into someone's ear and you got to like try to have the same message. And you know the more people that are involved in that, the the more morphed that message is going to come out on the other side. So you can see on the screen where all these manuscripts come from, but there are over 25,000 manuscripts. To put that in perspective, the next closest text, the Iliad, has 1,900. So there's way more manuscripts in in the New Testament than anywhere else. And the Greek manuscripts that you see on the screen of 6,000, the average length is 550 pages. So when you stack those 25,000 manuscripts on top of one another, paper thin, it stretches over a mile. And that should make you feel a little bit better. Oh, the reason there's so many differences is because it's been copied so many times. He's right. We don't have the originals. You want to know why? Because they were written on papyrus. Papyrus has the consistency of a brown paper bag at your grocery store. It lasts 100 years at best unless it's treated. So we don't have the originals, but you know what we have? So many manuscripts, over a mile long. And that should give you some confidence. But when you look at the quality, it gets even more fun. Because what they notice is that 70% of the differences or variances are spelling differences. So this is one example. The Apostle John, you can in Greek spell that with one N, Johannes, or with two N's. So every single time that happens, that's one of those variants. 70% is spelling. Another 29% are are what we call alterations that can't be translated, so untranslatable. And what I I mean by that is the English language, uh, there's only one way to say each sentence, right? If I were to say Jesus loves Paul, in English I can only say it that way. Jesus loves Paul. But in Greek and in some other languages too, if you've studied foreign languages, it it actually doesn't matter the word order. What matters is the endings on the words because that tells what the object or subject of the verb is. And so actually you can say it in many different ways. You can say Jesus loves Paul, like Jesus loves Paul, or you can say it like Paul loves Jesus or loves Jesus Paul, loves Paul Jesus. It doesn't matter. What matters is the endings and it'll still mean the same thing. Plus in Greek, you can add the definite pronoun, uh, the, the definite article, I should say, to the pronoun. And so you could say the Jesus loves the Paul. The Paul loves the Jesus. The love Paul, the Jesus. Doesn't matter. 29% are those things. And so when you add those numbers up, putting our math hat on on for a second, 70 plus 29, Bart Ehrman doesn't tell you that 99% of the variances don't matter, which leaves us with 1%. And this is the orthodoxy piece. And what I mean by orthodoxy, that word orthodox, which the opposite of that is heterodox, which is heresy. Orthodoxy means correct teaching or doctrine, is... Of the 1%, if, if, if we didn't have them or if they're in question, would it, our overall doctrines about God be any different? There are seven debatable sections in the New Testament. 
The two primary largest ones are John 7, 53 to 8, 11. That's the adulterous woman thrown at the feet of Jesus. And the end of the gospel of Mark, chapter 16, verses 9 through 20, some final departing words from Jesus to his disciples. Read through those and, I, and read through the other five. And what you will find is if we didn't have them, nothing about our overall doctrine changes. And actually, what I think is fascinating about our English text that many of us have is if you were to turn right now to John 7, 53, it will actually be authentic and transparent with you and tell you some early manuscripts do not include these verses. I think that's really cool. I think that speaks more to the authenticity and to the honesty of what's really in here. Now, that's New Testament for preservation. Let me tell you Old Testament really fast. For a while, we only had actually three ancient manuscripts of the Old Testament. And the latest one that we could date was 900 AD until 1947 when a shepherd boy was throwing rocks into a cave. And he hit some, he could hear it hit pottery. And he walked into this and he discovered 600 ancient documents known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. And 25% of those ancient documents were the Old Testament in one bound copy, every single one of the 39 books except for the book of Esther. And so they carbon dated the Dead Sea Scrolls and these were not written on papyrus but leather. And they carbon dated them actually all the way back into about 100 BC. And so in one instance, we jumped a thousand years with our two most reliable Old Testament texts. And so there were really smart people that got together and said, well, let's compare the two. One of them was a professor named Arlade Harris, and his assignment was Isaiah. You get to look at Isaiah from the uh, first century BC and Isaiah from 900 AD and, 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 and see what's different. And so he gives this example in his study. He said he compared uh, Isaiah 53, and he said in all of Isaiah 53, only 17 letters are different, letters. Ten of them are spelling differences, like honor with an O and honor with an O-U, Old English. Four of them uh, have minor differences, such as the presence of a conjunction, which is just a matter of style, which means there were only three that actually made a difference. And that's found in Isaiah 53, verse 11. One of the texts said, he shall see, and the other text said, he shall see light, which doesn't make a difference. And he said, after all of this, what I see in Isaiah 53 is typical of the whole manuscript. And so in a thousand years, nothing had changed. Why? Because God wanted you to hear a message about his son. So I thought I'd end by just reading a few of those verses from Isaiah 53. And I hope that as I read them, not only do you have confidence in them, that it really is the word of God, but that you believe. This is a prophecy even before Jesus walked this earth. A hundred years before, Isaiah 53 said, Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. Come on, let's say this together. And by his wounds, we are healed. Why did God preserve a book? Why did God send his son to tell you a message that he loves you and to protect the message that's inside of this, that we really have a God that loves us, that we really have a God who sent his one and only son that came into this world and lived a perfect life so that by his wounds, we are healed from all of our wounds from all of our sins, from all of our mistakes. And this God really did die and he really did rise from the dead. And if it really is true, then it means anybody that believes in him and calls upon his name, the Bible says will not perish, but have everlasting life. 
God preserved that message for a people that so desperately need to hear it because he loves you so much. And so I pray that we wouldn't treat this book so cavalier, but with awe and respect that this really is God's word. Because when we open it and it really is God's word, his Holy Spirit breathes and is alive and active and changes hearts still today. So that's my call to action for you. We just finished 21 days of prayer yesterday. That doesn't mean, by the way, you should never pray again. (laughs) Um, So I want to start a 21 years of reading plan with you today. That You read it every day of your life. But your real call to action is just that you jump into a Bible plan if you're not already and you do it with at least one other person. You open it up, you see what God has to say to you. It'll change your life. Amen. Amen. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that video. Click the link below to join our Red Letter community where we're gonna send you emails and lots of content that's gonna help challenge you and grow you in your faith as a disciple of Jesus.